Tonight, Guy Gardner puts The Wire to shame as the hardest thing to ever come out of Baltimore, Demon Knight sets up for a literal battle of five armies, and Grifter puts out what can charitably be called a book. All that and more tonight on the Not-So-New 52. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 67 of the Not So New 52. I am your host and it's a week two and week twos for at least the time being means everything is part of an event and I will get to that ever so soon. But first, I just want to talk to you real quick, tiny little thing happening in two weeks time. Uh, the episode coming out December 26th, 2012. Um, it only has two comics and for any other reasonable thing, that would come out on a fifth week, but it's only a fourth week. And the week after that is what would then be the fifth week, but it's technically the next month, but it's still the 15th issues. All of this is to say uh, I've been numbering my episodes on the video stream, at least, to match which week it is. This being episode 15.2, the second week of the 15th month if you ignore zero a month. And um, because I'm the one who decides that numbering system, that fourth week is actually going to be 15.5. Does this mean anything at all to you? No, not at all. But I'm treating it as a fifth week because screw it, I can't fill an entire episode <laughs> with just two comics. So yes, we have another fifth week this month, even though technically we don't. It's confusing, but just listen to the episode as normal, and I promise it'll all make sense. Anyway, comics for this week. How about we jump right into it? So this week we have 13 comics, including the number 15 issues of Batgirl, Batman, Batman and Robin, Superboy, Green Lantern Corps, Deathstroke, Grifter, Suicide Squad, Legion Lost, Demon Knights, and Frankenstein. Additionally, we have the number 7 issue of The Ravagers and the number 3 issue of Team 7. As for events, who boy... Hold on to your horses. We had Death of the Family and Batman. Death of the Family tie-ins with Batgirl, Batman and Robin, and Suicide Squad. Black Diamond probabilities in Team 7 and Demon Knights. A Rot World tie-in with Frankenstein. And a... which one is it? Hell on Earth, that's right, in Superboy. Oh, and of course, how could I forget? Green Lantern Corps has Rise of the Third Army. So out of 13 comics... Nine of them are tying into events, and when everything's an event, nothing is. So let's get into the nothing events. Batman number 15, written by Scott Snyder, art by Greg Capullo. This is the next part of Death of the Family. And last issue we left off with Batman and Joker at the Reservoir. And Joker says, I know who the entire Bat family is. So we pick up in that same spot. Batman has some narration saying like, hey, uh, everyone has little things they can't control about their body. And he gets into pupils and how they expand and they retract. And there's all these different ways to read pupils. But the Joker's pupils don't react. They're always just pinpricks. And it's very unnerving. So we see Joker, he's recounting his claim, like, yep, I know who everyone is under the mask. And I'm, I'm going to be coming after all of them in the next few days. So read those tie-ins. And Batman's like, Joker, you're sick, man. And he's like, yep, definitely. And then the police show up, led by Harvey Bullock. And Joker's like, hey, Harv, I was wondering where you were. I, th I thought I was going to snap your neck in the first issue, but best to do it now. And Harvey Bullock's like, okay, how about this instead? Snipers, are you trained on the Joker? And they're ready to open up fire on Joker, pretty much. Batman tells him, like, don't involve the police. Whatever you're doing, don't involve this between you and me. And Joker just makes a call on a phone. And all of a sudden, all the police cars explode. And in all the chaos and everything like that, uh, Batman, he busts out of the restraints and he leaps after Joker. He gets caught up in an explosion, but continues to leap his way through and punch Joker in the face. And he's like, all right, so here's what's going to happen. You're going to tell me where Alfred is, and then I'm going to hurt you a lot. 
And Joker's like, I can't do that yet. Jo Alfred's going to be the one serving our dinner between you, me, and the rest of the Bat Brats. So I still need him. Also, you just punched me with your bare hand. And it turns out the Joker had a paralytic toxin on his skin. So that when Batman punched him, he would start freezing up. So at that point, Joker frees himself from Batman's grip and says like, so... You're officially invited to the dinner. Here's your invite. And he kicks Batman in the face and sends him down into the waters below. So then we have Bruce waking up and the Bat family is all around him, except it's out of costume. It's just the normal people. And they're like, Bruce, hey, good thing you're awake. Uh, we caught Joker. Yeah, when he tried to escape off the bridge, Jason Todd here, the Red Hood, he got him. And uh, we found Alfred. He was totally safe and sound in the storage container. So literally the whole arc's done now. And Batman's like, wow, that's weird. Anyway, can I see Alfred? And they're like, yeah, sure. Hey, Alfred, come on in. And Alfred comes in and he is wearing his own face the same way the Joker wore his. And he starts swinging an axe at Bruce. And of course, it's all just a nightmare sequence. So then Bruce actually wakes up. He's still in his bat outfit, but this time the rest of the bat family is there in costume. And they're like, hey man, um, why does the Joker say he knows who we are? And Batman's like, he doesn't. He's just trying to get to you. This is all just one of his games. And they're like, right, right, right. Okay, but why did he take Alfred if he doesn't know who we are? And they're like, oh, it's because Alfred is part of Batman. I told Nightwing this last time. Bruce Wayne, Batman Incorporated, it all leads back to Alfred. It fits. And Nightwing's like, yeah, you said that, but you also left out some certain stuff. For instance, Joker mentioned something about a special secret that you were keeping from us. Want to fill us in? And Batman tells him, tells them all the story of way back before any of the Robins, uh, Batman was fighting Joker on a blimp, like that he was going to gas the city with. And he knocked Joker off of the blimp and stopped it before it could gas the city. But when he went back to get the Joker, who was knocked into the water, he couldn't find him anywhere, and he was so pissed off that he lost the Joker. He went home in the bat boat, and he came up, and he's just like, you know, I'm going to bed. And he went up, and when he came back down to the cave just a few hours later, he noticed that there was a Joker card in the bat boat. And that a, re a replica of that is the Joker card that he keeps in the bat cave nowadays. And they're like, so Joker was in the bat cave. And they're like, no, no, no. The, the, the card just... Like, must have come off of my costume or something. It must have been an adhesive. He didn't make it into the Batcave. And they're like, well, how do you know? And it's like, because I have all these sensors. And there were, like, miles of caves. And literally, he would have had to hold on to the Batboat 50 miles per hour underwater for miles. It is impossible. And they're like, yeah, because the Joker's never done anything impossible before. Seriously, though, could he know who we are? And it's like, no, he doesn't know who we are. This conversation's done. I'm out. And everyone's, like, pissed at Bruce now because he's the one causing the rift right now because he's keeping secrets from his family, things that the Joker knows. So, yeah, they're all a little bit angry. And that all goes into their tie-ins. So, Batman, he recounts, he's like, all right, Joker's been planning this for a year. He doesn't really have many entry points that I can break into. However, he used a phone at the reservoir and... Using some signal tracking stuff, I traced the number to this phone that was bought from the store. And using security cameras, I got the guy who bought it. And he busts into this guy's house. And he's having a family dinner. And he's like, why'd you buy Joker the phone, man? And he's like, he he was blackmailing me. He said it would kill my whole family. He said he would kill all of our families. And he's like, what do you mean all of our families? And it turns out that this guy is a guard at Arkham. And without Batman's knowing, for the past, like, year, Joker has been threatening all of the guards at Arkham who have families that they will all be killed. So he's been sending them home and telling them, pretend like everything's okay, while he does some major construction work deep inside Gotham. And Batman had no knowledge that any of this was happening. So he then parks his car, walks up to Arkham, and heads inside. And then we get the mirror of that opening section of the pupils. He's like, yep, there was only one time I saw the Joker's pupils move, and that was when they were expanding, as if he was in love. So, yeah, that's the issue. Um, I enjoy it. I think it's a solid one. I, I think 
this is where it gets into the idea of the family. Like, Joker's been saying this whole time of, oh, I'm going to come after all you think. And yeah, in the tie-ins, it has been that going on. But if you were just reading this particular arc, this is how it starts to be the, okay, they're, they're not trusting Bruce now. And Bruce recognizes that this is all part of Joker's play to sow this distrust. So... It is getting there. Um, Art-wise, I think it's creative, but also it's just kind of whatever. Like, it's nothing too fantastic this time. There's no moment that's, like, really incredible. The only thing I will give it is uh, the scene where he's recounting the blimp. It looks like it's almost a different artist, but it's still Greg Capullo. So it's got a different style to it that feels a bit more Silver age but it feels good. So, yeah, overall, I'm going to give this one, I'll give it a 7.5. It's just kind of like a, it's forwarding things, it's getting things around, it's more so setting up what it feels like for a big sort of crazy set piece issue with the Arkham stuff next time. So, we'll see how that flies out, but yeah, this time I'll give it a 7.5. Batman and Robin, number 15, written by Peter Tomasi, art by Patrick Gleason. This is a Death of the Family tie-in, and it's it's a very strange read. So we open up with Damien apparently being put on monitor duty now that Alfred has been taken hostage, and he's not happy about it. Obviously, he wants to be out there trying to track down Joker and help his dad. And he's sitting there talking to Titus, his dog, and he's like, yep, while Batman's so focused on finding Joker, perhaps I can be the one that finds Alfred. So he does some detective work and he looks around trying to find something that could trace down the Joker, but he he knows there's probably not going to be much of anything. But he does come up for a very specific urine sample, which... For for some reason, it's apparently a hyena urine, but I don't remember that being from the issue. But regardless, he goes to the zoo because that's the only place in Gotham that hyenas would be. So he breaks in and he goes to the hyena exhibit and he sees that they're feeding on human remains. And he's like, oh, God, is that Alfred? Turns out it's just a security guard, which doesn't seem much better. But, you know, the hyenas, though, are rabid. They start to attack Robin. He manages to make an escape, and he's just like, nope, I hate the zoo. But it turns out there was a toxin on the fur of the hyenas as he was beating them off. So he crashes down into the aviary and passes out. And when he wakes up, he is coming out of a giant robin's egg that Joker is swinging from a trapeze bar in and has his face currently on upside down. And he's like, oh, you thought that the hyenas were having the butler for dinner. Isn't that a isn't that a funny joke? So he jumps down, he turns his face right side up. And then the rest of this issue is kind of just Joker's philosophy on how he feels about Robin to a Batman. He's he just goes off for like ten straight pages of like, you make him worse. You make him so he is not all that he can be. And Damien, he's not playing into the game. He's not falling for any of Joker's stuff. Um, But he does just keep saying, like, just tell me where Pennyworth is and I'll only hurt you a little bit. And he shows Damien a video of Alfred uh, that we heard the audio to before. And... Damien's like, yeah, for that, I'm I'm gonna go ahead and break Batman's no kill rule because that's not my rule i'm gonna do that so he's ready to kill joker over this and they keep on talking more and more and he could joker just keeps on telling the exact same thing of like you make him so much worse blah 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 until finally it comes to the point of like all right here's the deal uh i know what your fear is and he pulls this lever and all of these grubs and worms and stuff start coming down and basically suffocating Damien who's chained up at this point he's like your fear is that you will be responsible for Batman's death but Batman's fear is that he'll be responsible for yours so let's see what happens when we force you to deal with that 
and all of a sudden out of the grubs comes a jokerized batman and he's like your father figure because he doesn't say dad directly but he's like your father figure is going to try to kill you and you're going to have to get over the fact that you don't want to kill him so yep that's the issue as a whole it's it's I know I explained it very quickly, but it is actually a very dense read. Not in a bad way, but the philosophy of it, where they just keep going back and forth. It's dense. What I do want to point out, though, is Patrick Leeson's art. He has drawn the Joker in a different way than I have seen throughout this entire event. And it's genuinely horrifying. Like, I thought Capullo's stuff was, like, very nasty, and it is. But, like, this is straight up because of the way the inks are done, like horror. Like it's an unsettling, you can't see the eyes. Some of the times you can't even see the teeth. It takes away all the stuff that you consider to be like the Joker and just makes it this dark nothingness inside. So it's creepy. I really do want to give the art credit on that. But when it comes down to this issue as a whole, I see it's the issue of I'm only feeling this way because I've read all of the other tie-ins and the joker in every other tie-in is saying the exact same thing of how batman needs to work alone if this were the only one i was reading i think it would work fine i don't see any issue with it at all but because i've heard this thing by this point at least four times it's just kind of like yeah i get it and you're not adding much new to that conversation but if i ignore that stuff and judge the issue just on its own merits i'd probably give this one i'll give it a seven um, art is fantastic. Writing is good. Again, it's really hard for me to move past that I have heard this exact issue before, like three times, but it's, it's solid the whole way through. It is a decent issue. So I give it a seven and I believe next issue is still tie in territory. So, oh, and we got confirmation that, uh, he did actually run the Saturn club from last issue, which I didn't get any confirmation of, but yep, he did. So, yippee. Bad Girl number 15, written by Gail Simone, art by Daniel Sampier. This is more of the Death of the Family tie-in. Last issue, we had Joker taking Batgirl's mother hostage. Her brother led him, led her to the Joker, and then the Joker proposed to her. This issue, it just follows on. So we've got this framing device of years ago in Arkham Asylum. A doctor is talking to Joker, this uh, woman named Dr. Yi, I think. Why I? Um, and it's interspersed throughout. Basically, the gist of it is she has Joker's journal where he has just written down all of his thoughts and whatnot and everything he's thought about recently. And she's like, I, I literally can't read this. It is illegible. And he's like, well, let me just walk you through some of the greatest hits. And he walks through just the, these inane ramblings, these horrible things until he gets to one point of saying like, Oh, and that page is what I do. If I ever met a nine year old girl named Sasha and the doctor's like, I have a nine year old girl named Sasha. And Joker's like, now, now, don't skip to the ending quite yet. So, I'll get back to that. But regardless, Batgirl is in this roller rink with Joker. And he's skating around just being like, Oh, yeah, Batgirl, this is going to be great. We're going to be, uh... We're going to be such a happy couple. But I need you to be honest with me, okay, Batgirl? I need you to, to really listen to me, understand that? And she's just kind of like, This guy shot me... And now he's hurt my mother and has cut off her finger. I'm going to murder him. Maybe not murder, but hurt at the very least. So he's pulling out a gun, threatening uh, Batgirl's mom because she's not... Unlike the... Uh, I think the end of last issue had her basically saying okay. Or maybe it was just the proposal. Oh, it was just the proposal, my bad. Uh, she finally confirms it. She's like, okay, yes, fine, whatever, I'll marry you. Don't hurt her. And she's like, oh, of course, whatever. So then we get to uh, James Gordon Jr., who gets a call from Alicia. He's watching all this play out at the roller rink. 
And Alicia calls up and says, like, hey, uh, I needed to stay somewhere, and you're the only name I could think of. Please come get me. And he's like, I'm kind of busy. She's like, please. And I'm like, okay, sure, yeah, I'll be on my way. So then Batgirl, he sees, she sees the Joker is, like, posturing, giving all these big speeches and whatnot. And so she just cuts through and just like, to anyone who is working with the Joker... The average radius of a nail bomb, which he's currently standing right next to, is 40 meters. So, you might want to leave. And then she takes the opportunity uh, of catching Joker off guard to start choking him out and just start, like, punching all of his vital organs. And he's like, yep, this is your liver, there's your kidney, and this is your spine. And as he is coughing up blood on the ground, uh, he she goes for Joker's gun and picks it up and is just like, nope, see, I'm not going to kill you, but I am going to do the same thing you did to me. And she aims the gun at Joker's spine and is like, yeah, no, this is totally worth it. This is absolutely what I need to do right now. But before uh, she can pull the trigger, one of Joker's men fires off a, like a warning shot, stops Batgirl from doing what she's doing. And it's like, all right, fine, you still got people loyal to you. Sucks. And Joker hands over a list saying... All right, well, here's the instructions. You're going to meet up with me, and then once you do, I'll free Miss Gordon here. So at that point, Batgirl's like, all right, fine, whatever. I'll follow your instructions. She knocks, like, the crap out of uh, one of Joker's goons, grabs some ice from the ice machine to keep her mother's finger reattachable, I guess, and then says, like, now, Joker, you do understand the rules no longer apply here, right? And he's like, yes, I know. It's fantastic, isn't it? So Batgirl makes her way out and then Joker gets a call on his cell phone and it turns out it's James Gordon Jr. And he's like, hey, listen, I know what you're up to. And Alicia's in the seat right next to him. She's like, hey, I know what you're up to. I can't allow that. That's my play thing. You're not allowed to have it. And Joker's like, I don't know who you are, but I don't like your tone. Goodbye. And click. So James points out like, well, I guess I'm going to help my sister. Let's go, Alicia. So at that point, uh, Batgirl makes her way to a condemned cathedral, and she makes her way inside. Inside, there are a bouquet of flowers with rotting rats on it and a veil for her to wear, and Joker instructs her to put, her on, put it on. And there is a priest being held at gunpoint by a Joker goon, and he's like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm, my congregation is in trouble, I have to do what's best for them. And we see the reveal that there's a bunch of Joker goons all here as quote-unquote witnesses that look like they're all going to beat the ever-loving crap out of Batgirl. And the framing device ends with her, with Joker leaning into the doctor being like, you know, here's the thing. I've, I've, I've always wondered if I were to get married, I mean, she would just run off and cheat on me, right? So what if instead, right after the wedding, right as soon as we get hitched, I cut off her arms and legs so she can never leave again. And he laughs at that. So, yeah, it's a little grim. It's a little bit extremely abusive. Um, I think it's, I don't know, it's good. But it also feels, at least for like the first five to ten pages, like it's just spinning its wheels. Like we had to go through a whole three-page thing of Batgirl officially saying yes. Which... I don't know, felt a little unnecessary. Like, the whole reason she hadn't killed Joker up to that point was because of the mom. I don't know. It just felt a little bit slow to me. But then once we got to the actual second half, now we got James Corden Jr. involved. We've got uh, Batgirl pulling a gun on Joker and is about to do it, which I still feel like she probably could have, even with the sniper right there. Because she didn't want to kill Joker. She just wanted to maim him. That's like Batman's every night. So... Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say I give this one a... I'll give it a 7. It's still good. It's still a solid, like, story being told, but I'm I'm not... This is definitely the middle bit. La like, last issue set it all up. Next issue will probably be the finale. This issue is definitely the middle bit, where it's like, we got you hooked last time. We're going to show how awesome it is next time but this issue is just kind of the bridge in between so i give it a seven it is still quality but it is lesser Suicide Squad number 15, written by Adam Glass, art by Fernando Dagnino. This is yet another tie-in to Death of the Family. 
And last issue, we had Harley Quinn. Uh, she did a favor for the Joker, and then Joker strung her up by the neck and said, like, ha ha, hee hee, let's see what we can do now. This issue picks up pretty much in the same spot. She's being choked out, and Harley's like, you know, I really like the Joker, because I thought, like, he was great. Not great in the way that he does great things, but great in the way that he was going to change the world, and you were right there next to him. But, um... Now I'm not so sure that was the right move, as finally the Joker lets down her chains, and she's able to breathe just long enough to pass out from being oxygen deprived for that long. And as she starts coming to, she sees, like, the original Joker for a second. She's like, oh, I had the most horrible dream that you would cut off your face and become some kind of monster. And Joker's like, monster? Well, I mean, that is actually happening. And as she comes to, we see that Joker is like, no, no, Harley, I'm not a monster. I'm fully realized. I am exactly what I was always going to be. And now you're going to join me. And he is trapped her in a straitjacket, strapped to a, gir- a gurney, dangling her over a vat of chemicals because of course and we see all of this through a cybernetic like bionic eye and it turns out that waller and yo-yo are watching this happen back from bell reeve and it's like yeah i knew that joker was going to show up uh, waller says and so that's why we had harley on the team because we knew eventually joker would come for harley and then we could have finally some like in-depth look at the Joker and Yo-Yo's like cool uh why am I here and she's like because I know that you want to be respected Yo-Yo so I'm showing you a little bit of respect okay so just deal and as such in return I want you to be like my super secret spy to spy on every member of Task Force X and he's like all right works for me so then back to the fight Joker is about to drop Harley into the vat she manages to get her legs free and wraps around joker's neck dragging him down with her he wasn't expecting that but then he gets his collar stuck on a rock harley breaks free and starts to jump out of the hole and he's like all right well see ya mr j and then joker summons up uh her two pet hyenas that she loved so much but turns out that he purposely gave them rabies so they are rabid and coming after harley and harley's like oh i can't believe you did this they were our babies and it's like ah no they're just like me fully realized So Harley punches them a bit. They go after and bite hers uh, somewhat. And she's like, nope, I know what I have to do. I'm so sorry, kitties. And she flips them up over into the vat of chemicals where there's no way for them to escape. And Joker's like, well, all right, you did it. So what? And she's like, I am going to kill you for this. And he basically just tells her like, no, you're not. You are unable to kill me. You are totally not possible. And then she just punches him in the face. And the fight continues on a little bit until uh, he starts calling her Harleen, saying, like, you never were truly Harley. You always had that little bit of Harleen in you. And that's why you were never fully in on this. And she he bites off her ear uh, and she stumbles over to a um, furnace nearby as Joker's coming after, and she manages to get one up on, smashes his head into the furnace. His face stays stuck to it for a minute until he reaches up and straps it back on. And then turns out that he had, um, when he bit off her ear, it was a way of delivering a bit of a toxin into their system. And so she freezes up, she's unable to move, and Joker's like, oh, but don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll make you the real Harley soon enough. And Harley's like, oh, maybe you're right. I never I never felt like I was doing the right thing when we were together, but I did love you. And she kisses Joker, and during the kiss, bites off his tongue, which is something. And she's like, yeah, no, here's the thing, Joker. I think we should break up. And Joker's like, oh, Harley, I'm very possessive. And he finally ends up knocking out Harley, dragging her into a back room and shackling her up to a wall and saying, and it's like surrounded with skulls and other bones and stuff like that. And it's like, Harley, here's the thing. You were never the only Harley. All these other people here, all these dead bodies, they were all previous Harleys. And you won't be the last one either. I'm going to leave you in here. You're going to die. And I'll have a new Harley to replace you before you even know it. So, so long. And just leaves her tied up in there. And at no point did uh, 
Amanda managed to see where they were, Didn't has no idea how to get to Harley, so she's off the grid. Uh, we see Waller walking out with Captain Boomerang, because apparently their deal was only temporarily in place that they worked together, so Boomerang's just walking out. And as they make their way to the front gates, Harley comes stumbling in. And we see that she managed to basically dislocate and break her wrists enough to get out of the shackles, and she's all bloodied up. But yeah, she managed to make her way out, and Joker's realized this as well. And then for one final page reveal, turns out Deadshot isn't dead. He wakes up in a hospital room, and he's totally okay. So, yep, had to have that. Um, Here's the thing. This is, like, the moment. This is where Harley, in continuity, separates from the Joker, becomes her own character, and therefore the juggernaut of DC that she had become for that period of time. The one that is seen now in movies and such like that. It is... It is an important issue. This is a key issue, I would say, in Harley's story. That being said, it kind of is just a whatever, you know? Like, in terms of death of the family, completely unnecessary. The fact that Joker's around, like, yeah. But it's not, this isn't breaking down Batman's family, as is the point of the event. This is just its own separate thing. In terms of Suicide Squad, again... It's they barely managed to tie it into the plot in general. If it wasn't for that last Deadshot panel, it's it wouldn't be a Suicide Squad book. It would just be a Harley Quinn issue that they had two pages of Amanda Waller just watching. And then you get to Harley Quinn. And in terms of character, this is probably one of her most important issues. And it just kind of feels like they were too beholden to the other two of trying to make those work to really focus on the fact that this is the Harley focused one so it's pulled all over it's a little bit iffy um but i do recognize it's important so i'm gonna go ahead and say this one is a this one's like a 6.5 it's it's good it's above average but it does have some issues with it and i think the biggest issue is that it had to happen in a suicide squad book during a tie-in like all of that just brings this big moment down a little bit so 6.5 We'll see what happens post tie-ins now. Superboy number 15, written by Tom DeFalco, art by like four different artists. Uh, Ron Friends, Roger Robinson, Ivan Coelho, and Emilcar Pina. Uh, This is the next part of Hell on Earth. And last time, I think in Superman... We had Superboy literally being tossed around by hell, just kind of as like a prop. He wasn't even in a character. He was just being thrown around. And this issue picks up with him unconscious on a car, and he's like, wow, I am literally dying. Like, I cannot move, and I am dying. And we see a whole crowd is gathered along with like a superhuman containment group, and they're moving in on Superboy's body. Because they're like, yeah, he's the terrorist that we've got notice of in uh, the Teen Titans book. He's wanted by the NYPD. We should probably bring him in. And Superboy, Superman is still talking to Hell. And Hell's like, I'm going to destroy the Earth. If, it, if that's what brings back Krypton, that's what I'm going to do. And you're literally going to be unable to stay in my way. So bye. And he just teleports out of there. And Superman's like, okay, I got to deal with that. But regardless, I hear an issue going on with Superboy. So he flies over to Superboy's body. He sees him basically dying. And he's like, hey, everyone, uh, I'm literally his only chance for survival. I'll take him from here. And the people who were trying to arrest him are like, "Uh, he's a criminal? And Superman's like, tough. And flies away with Superboy. So they go to the Fortress of Solitude down the Arctic. And Superboy is apparently conscious enough to be like, wow, okay, that's a lot. There's a lot going on there, but I do, I don't really know anything about Superman. I kind of just want to know whether he thinks I'm allowed to live because sounds like Kryptonian's got a thing against clones, but regardless, he sets him down in a chair, does some scans, and he's like, all right, apparently you're being torn apart at like the genetic level. So he uses his microscopic vision to see that Superboy has, instead of the regular two strands of DNA that most people have, Superboy has three 
and he isn't sure what to do about it. So then we cut over to Supergirl's sanctuary, her own little fortress of solitude under the sea, where Hell has brought her. And last issue, Hell impersonated Superman to say some very hurtful things to Supergirl. And Supergirl's like, I can't believe he said such awful things about me. And Hell's like, I know, right? He's a total dick. Anyway, I know that you and I can work together, but right now I have some stuff I gotta go do. And he teleports out of there, leaving Kara alone. So then Superman's on a call between Cyborg and Dr. Veritas, basically saying like, all right, uh, someone want to tell me what's going on with Superboy here? And they're like, well, he's got human and Kryptonian DNA. That accounts for two of the strands. We don't know what the third is. And they're like, all right, I, anybody have an idea how to make him not fall apart? And they're like, well, it's the Kryptonian DNA. That's the one that's causing a problem. So you need like Kryptonian containment thing. And Superman's like, cool, got it. Bye. Shuts off the call. And he comes to the conclusion that his battle armor that he's been wearing uh, is Kryptonian. It is Kryptek. So he takes it off of himself, which ends up just turning into one of the little Pentagon crests. And then he puts it onto Superboy, which immediately then becomes the Superman outfit just on Superboy. And he freaks out. He's like, what did you do? I feel like my senses are on fire. And he wakes up, if that wasn't clear. And it turns out that this suit, like, restricts his telekinesis powers, but he does still have other powers. And Superboy looks on. He's like, wait a minute, hold on. on." The tech in the Krypton suit, like, it was supposed to change to your family's crest, but since it still is Superman, like, the L family, crap, you're actually probably my clone. That complicates things. So we get a little cutaway real quick to Jimmy Olsen, who's waiting outside the uh, emergency room for the two guys that Superboy beat up last of his issues. And they walk out and just knock the camera out of Jimmy's hands. And then he takes a cell phone photo of him and just says, like, yeah, I had a feeling they were criminals. So anyway, yeah, there's that. Back to the fortress, Superboy is freaking out as Superman puts on uh, his classic t-shirt look from Action Comics. And... It literally just keeps coming down to like, why won't everyone just leave me alone? Leave me alone, Superman. And he he throws Superman like through a wall. And he's like, um, I don't have super strength. I just have my telekinesis. What's going on? And it turns out that because of the suit, his telekinesis is like literally condensing and concentrating itself to imitate Superman's powers even more so. And Superboy's like, I don't like this. I don't want to be like you. I'm my own guy. And he rips off the suit uh, that Superman just put on him and immediately collapses. And Superman's like, dude, your literal genetic level is falling apart. You need this to live. And he's like, am I always going to have to wear it? He's like, I don't know. Just put it on for right now. So he puts it back on. And so he's wearing the Superman outfit. And they're like, all right, so... What do we do now? And Superman just tells him, we're going to track Hell and we're going to find a way to beat him. He's like, that sounds like a stupid plan. And then Hell shows up right behind him. He's like, yeah, that is a stupid plan. By the way, sweet digs, it's mine now. And he just throws both of them out of the fortress. And that's where we leave off. Um, I enjoy it in so much as it's the least Superboy that Superboy has been. Like, not in character, but in focus. The fact that this issue, like, it, he was unconscious for half of it. And we spent time with other characters. Like, I cannot appreciate that more because I am so sick of Superboy's whining about the exact same. Why did everyone just leave me alone? Like, shut up, dude. You are part of this universe. Deal with it. Um... It's interesting to see him wearing the outfit, the Superman outfit. It, I, I feel like there has to be some kind of small change to it, but I genuinely can't place what it is because it's just, it, it looks so close to the same, but not. It's probably the lack of the cape now, honestly, if I'm thinking about it. Uh, but yeah, it's an interesting development to see that, yeah, he's wearing the actual Superman colors and he's working with Superman. I didn't... I thought this would kind of be like a four-way fight, but it seems like we're kind of boiling this down into two sides of Hell and Supergirl versus Superman and Superboy. And I'm sure Supergirl will make the change at some point when she finds out the truth. But that'll come in its own book next week, I think. 
Yes. So overall, good issue. Not amazing, not fantastic. It's kind of just, oh yeah, Superboy has to be the focus of this issue somehow. So they just decide that his genetic level was being torn apart because that wasn't established in any other issue. It was just that he was in like some sort of stasis that hell puts him in. So uh, I'm going to give this one a... I'll give it a seven. It's I know that may sound a little bit high, but genuinely, I don't really have an issue with anything this particular issue did. It's just in the larger tapestry of hell on earth, it does feel kind of slow. Like at this point, we should have been doing more. So seven, we'll see if it improves with the next few issues. Green Lantern Corps number 15, written by Peter Tomasi, art by Fernando Pissarin. This is the next part of Rise of the Third Army. And last issue, Guy Gardner was kicked out of the Corps. He is officially no longer a Green Lantern member. And when he gets back, he immediately starts punching the walls. And, like, his knuckles are bleeding. And he's like, I was literally the best Green Lantern for like a little bit there. I had my name written in the Book of Allah. What even just happened? And as he's freaking out over it, he casts off all of his Green Lantern gear. He puts on a motorcycle jacket and helmet. And he just starts driving. And we see he goes down to his dad's house. His brother's there. And he calls up his brother, or sorry, he calls up his dad. His brother answers and basically says like, hey, how's it going? And things going? he's like, yeah, no, just you're watching the game with dad. What's up with you? And he's like, yeah, you know, space cop stuff. And the brother tells him like, yeah, it was kind of weird how you just picked us all up in the middle of our lives and took us to the Justice League. But also meeting the Justice League was awesome. So no harm, no foul there. And Guy explains, like, yeah, I just wanted to make sure you guys were safe. It's it's fine. And the dad hops onto the phone and it's like, yeah, you know, uh, your your brother and your sister, they don't need any special space powers of the Justice League to fight crime. They do it with just a gun and a nightstick. They're so much better than you. And Guy's like, cool, thanks, Dad. You always were the best. Um, and basically Guy's just like, hey, are you sure everything's fine, though? Are, like, is everything fine? His brother's like, yeah, no, we're, we're doing fine. There's nothing crazy going on so at that point uh guy kicks back on his motorcycle and it uh a dog starts barking on the phone and he's like um sure does sound like exactly what's going on outside our house right now and by that point guy's already driven off and he's made the decision like you know what dad was kind of right except i don't even need a gun i don't need a ring i can fight crime just by being guy gardner and he goes around Baltimore and he just kind of uses his reputation of being a Green Lantern to scare everyone into submission. He's like, yeah, that's right. I came back to Earth. And he doesn't let him know that he doesn't have his ring anymore. But he's like, don't make me use my ring or else you're going to regret it. So he's easily stopping crime in that way until finally he's like, OK, I'm going to do something big. And he goes down to the docks and he's like, there is a homegrown terrorist organization that's looking to get a shipment tonight of missiles and i'm gonna stop him and he activates a forklift that like drops a car right in the middle of their crew he goes in just swoops in like indiana jones starts kicking everybody in the face and as he's beating everyone up and he's like that's right i'm a green lantern don't make me use my ring and then he gets a whole bunch of target sites all over him and it turns out that this whole thing was a, like, two-year-long FBI, like, plans where none of these guys were actually terrorists, but they were trying to get to the arms dealer that was supplying them. And wouldn't you know it, the sister, Gloria, he, she uh, was helping out as just local police backup. And she sees Guy there. She's like, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm gathering that I'm screwing something up here. And so they read the rights to Guy for having ruined this entire operation and his own sister has to put the cuffs on him and lead him into the car. So that's where the issue ends. However, I skipped over like three pages, the three pages that actually make this arise of the third army crossover. So we have one page of John Stewart still following Mogo last issue. He ran into fatality, the star Sapphire. 
And basically, he's just like, hey, I blew up your whole planet. And she's like, yeah, you did do that. And he's like, I suck. And she's like, all right, can we stop, like, the pity party? Like, I told you to get over it back in the day. Clearly, you didn't listen. And he's like, yeah, I'm not good at anything, am I? And then she's like, all right, so what are you doing here? And he's like, I'm following this uh, piece of the planet Mogo, which I also blew up, by the way. And she's like, well, here's the thing. This is like the she part of the planet. There's a he part and a she part of Mogo. And the he part is, I think, trying to... Let me see what they say here. One of them is trying to get to the other one. And the other is looking for the rest of the planet's core, which is apparently being held prisoner. And based off of, like, the trajectory of this piece of it, they're able to, like, trigonometry figure out the direction they need to go in to get to the pieces that are being held prisoner. So that's where their goal is right now. And then we get the Guardians who are looking over all the Rise of the Third Army stuff, and they're like, wow, we... I didn't expect this to go this fast. We're doing great. This is a great time for this. And we see Salak, the Green Lantern Corps switchboard, pretty much is watching the whole thing of the Guardians just boasting, like, soon we will have them take over the universe. And once they've taken over enough Green Lanterns, we can bring the assault back to our home world, and then they will not be stopped. And one of the Guardians reaches up and pull just out of thin air, he pulls a little nanite camera, which is how Salak was seeing all this. And he's like, crap. And immediately the Guardians show up in the roof overhead. And they're like, hey, Salak, were you spying on us? And he's like, uh, no. And they're like, we think you were. And you must have heard quite a bit, didn't you? And he's like, no. And he's like, well, who else did you tell what you heard? And he says, no one. I'm the only one who knows. And it's like, well, we don't believe you, Salak, because you lied twice so far and he's like well i would have liked you to believe that you guys were guarding the universe you're the guardians for god's sakes why have you have you something mind controlling you have you turned evil and they're like no we're still us this was just the logical step forward we're getting re rid of free will and so it's like free will is what makes life life you're trying to extinguish all life in the universe they're like no we're protecting it and he's like no you're not you're not doing that and they're like, all right, well, agree to disagree, but we are going to imprison you deep inside this uh, basically Guantanamo Bay-esque, like, it's a coffin. They're putting him in a coffin in space, pretty much, and they're just sealing it up and just being like, all right, well, we'll deal with you later, bye. And they just leave him. So, yeah, that happens in the middle. Um, I mean, it's... I don't know exactly how Guy is going to get his ring back, but the fact that we're focusing on the Salak part of this seems pretty clear that Guy is going to be coming back. Like, clearly, they're just not going to leave him off the core forever. I'm just wondering how soon it's going to happen in the scale of this event or whether it's going to happen afterwards. Uh, the Jon Stewart thing is, of course, its own thing in deep space. I do think that this is probably the best opportunity they have to focus on a plot that is just the core and not any of the human members because with guy being gone and john in deep space they could have like salak and i guess uh kilowog just run their own plot for a while and i'd be very interested to see that so we'll see where it goes from there this issue though it's fine it's good enough issue i think the opening pages of guy freaking out are probably the best in the whole book um i really don't have anything negative to say about those it's just a nice little character introspective moment so i'm gonna give this one 7.5 I enjoy it, I think it's good, and we'll see how it continues next time. Frankenstein, Agent of Shade number 15, written by Matt Kint, art by Alberto Ponticelli. This is a tie-in to the Rot World event going on right now. And last issue, we had Frankenstein going across the world, attacking some titans, and getting pieces of this machine and the very last titan you need to attack was literally this massive like island size one and he was approached by some robot women because robot women so he's talking to nina through like the comms and she's like hey do you have the last piece is everything good what's going on and he's like uh running into some issues but you know we're doing what we can 
And we see Frankenstein on the back of this huge titan with these robot women trying to fight against it. And they're like, hey, do you have a way of, like, actually killing this beast, robot women? Because it doesn't seem like cutting and shooting at it's doing much of anything. And... They basically say, like, look, here's the thing. We became robots in order to live beyond the rot in a way that, like, the rot couldn't affect us. But, yeah, our world's kind of gone, so we're going to sacrifice ourselves in order to give you a fighting chance. And they all, like, fuse together Voltron style, except in a melted-down sort of way, and become this, like, 40-foot-long golden sword that is able to cut through the Titan and finally kill it. And they even say here, it's like, they literally could have become anything. They could have become like a self-sustaining ship that could just fly out of Earth's atmosphere. But the rot corrupted their minds and all they could think of was a weapon. So Frankenstein goes to town, cuts up the Titan and gets the last piece in the machine. And then it takes him a few weeks before he finally makes it to the rendezvous point of Monument Valley in the uh, desert. And when he finally gets there, he's being chased down by this whole army of rot people led by Victor Frankenstein, who was, I guess, a previous avatar of the rot. And he's like, okay, guys, I have the piece, but we got to go like right now. And as he arrives, his horse is taken over by the rot. He's unable. She's un it's unable to continue on. And Khalees is down at the bottom waiting. To basically run diversion, he's going to sacrifice himself in order to get Frankenstein up to the top of the pieces. So he fights back the army of the rot as Frankenstein makes his way to the bottom of one of the mesas. He has no way of getting up to the top quickly, but then, uh, I just said her name, whatever her name was, comes down and grabs Frankenstein with a jetpack and flies up to the top of the mesa so they can start to get their stuff together. Nina, that was it. So they get up there and Frankenstein, like, it's like, all right, we got to get the machine put together. We got to do what we can. We have to save these people. And Nina just tells them to, like, shut up for a second, and they hug. And so they start setting up the machine of the soul grinder as fast as they can. And as they do so, the rot starts climbing up the side of the mesa, and Frankenstein's doing what he can to knock him down. But eventually, Victor shows up, and it's like, you know you can't touch me, Frankenstein. Like, I am beyond your touch. And Frankenstein's like, yeah, well, you can't hurt me with the rod either, so I guess we're at a stalemate. And he's like, eh, not exactly. And so Victor goes over to Nina and starts, like, killing her and using her to corrupt the rot. And Frankenstein's like, nope, stop it. Stop it right now. And he tries to attack Victor. It obviously isn't working as he continues to kill Nina more and more. And then it turns out that Victor apparently has been evolving to some extent in that his attacks are actually able to start hurting Frankenstein it starts burning away his flesh but in the moment that they both Nina and Frankenstein have their hands on Victor they pick him up and they take whatever minuscule soul he has left in this rotten form and throws it into the soul grinder uh, but it comes at the sacrifice of also Nina going in as well so both Nina and Victor go through the Soul Grinder, and she comes out the other side with, like, the full stitched-up look. Basically, she's now undead. She is just like Frankenstein. So Victor's gone, the rot stops attacking them, and all of the human survivors that were up top on this Monument Valley with them, they go through the uh, Soul Grinder as well and become basically Frankensteins as well. And the final... or we see that the big thing here is now Frankenstein has his own army, immune to the rot, and he will be known as King Frankenstein. And as on the final page here, sort of an epilogue, they have them all moving through the desert on undead horses, and they're making their way towards the Red Kingdom, the last holdout that they think life was going to be in San Diego, as we've seen in Animal Man's book. And they're hoping that it's going to be a good place, as Nina's narrating, to be safe because Nina has Frankenstein's kid. She's pregnant. That's crazy. Um, I really like this. I think, here's the thing. I thought this was going to be stretched over two issues because there is one more issue left of Frankenstein. But um, yeah, it turns out that's just not going to be related. That's going to be a totally separate thing, which is insane to me. But I think this did a good job. It 
felt paced right. Like we had an issue just focused on taking out the behemoths. We had an issue focused on getting to this final location. I think that it was a solid, solid arc here to wrap up the story. Clearly we have one more. I'm curious to see if that's going to be set post rot world if it's just going to be kind of a intermediary story i don't know but it's going to be it's going to be something overall this book has been enjoyable and i think this last arc was better than the arc before it because i had some problems following that this one was very much cut and dry easy to understand and it was a good tie it's it, genuinely i think the best part about it is that it's a solid tie-in it expands the world that was built in the event while not being necessary on its own but still a good story. So I'm going to give this one, I'm going to give it an eight. And I think a lot of that also comes down to that last page reveal. Because that's just, that's good setup for just future stories that Frankenstein has a new kid. Because they established that Frankenstein's old kid basically had to be put down. So there's a new child and that's going to be super interesting to see. So eight for this, really enjoying it. Team 7, number 3, written by Justin Jordan, art by Julius Gopez. So, last issue, they fought through this aerial base only to discover that the thing they're looking for is actually in the Sentinel Islands, and this mad dictator guy is also after it. So, they make their way to the Sentinel Islands, and they say, like, yeah, you know... This place has a natural electromagnetic freak thing where none of their electronics are going to work, so they have to go in way under tech. So they literally raft into the uh, island. And when they make their way there, they see this sheer, basically, glass wall that's covered in spikes that they have to climb up. And they're like, all right, so when we get up to the top here, there should be like an uncontacted tribe. And then we can figure out from them where to go from for the black diamond and by the way this is a black diamond probability tie-in don't think i mentioned that but it is so they get up there and the entire tribe has just been decimated like everyone is dead but there are also bodies of mercenaries so they're like oh okay so we're running a little bit late to the party but we should go ahead and hop on in there so they start walking through the tribe and at one point they bronson starts making conversation with grifter Saying like, hey, Grifter, I got a question. You're the only guy who wears a mask. Why is that? And Grifter's like, ah, it's because I don't think we're going to stay as super secret as they want us to be. And I don't want my face to be out there once this all blows up. That doesn't really answer the question because it goes against the Grifter's entire continuity. But you know what? Whatever. We're just going to get right on by that. So at that point, Canary goes into a building. It's filled with dead children. She's like, I need to find these people, Kurt, and make them hurt. And as they're making their way through, um, they find one of the tribe members is still alive, an old man. He's on the verge of death, though. And he's speaking in his own native tongue that nobody can understand, but he's basically saying, like, hey, don't go there. Don't go to the heart of hell. Stay away from it. And Deathstroke's like, I don't, I don't get what you're saying. And then this voice from behind speaks up, and it turns out it's Essence. If you don't remember Essence... It's a ghost lady from Red Hood and the Outlaws. So Essence is here and she says, she tells Deathstroke, hey, he says not to go to the heart of hell, but he's wrong. And Deathstroke starts opening up fire and everyone's like, what are you shooting at, dude? We can't see anything. And Deathstroke starts talking to Essence and it's like, oh, only you can see me and you can hear me. And I, you can call me Essence, but I have to tell you. And Deathstroke's like, nah. We're not doing this. You're either going to show yourself to everybody or I'm going to ignore you. And she's like, but it's of grave importance. And he's like, the only reason you would be contacting me is because you need me to do something. And I'm not going to do anything if my team thinks I'm crazy. So you're going to go ahead and show yourself to all of them. And she's like, all right, fine, whatever. So she shows herself to all of Team 7. And she's like, hey, guys, hi. Um, You need to pick up the pace and get to the heart of hell. And then we cut over to the... Uh, mercenary groups that have taken a few of the prisoners hostage and they're making their way through the island when all of a sudden a ghost pops out I'm not kidding and attacks all of the mercenaries and the the tribe people are just like cowering in the back 
And the leader of the mercenaries, seemingly named Grin, he is like, hey, question, why aren't they attacking you? And he sees that they're all wearing talismans around their necks. I was like, I'm willing to bet it's those talismans. So he takes one off of the little girl and puts it on himself. The little girl gets taken by the uh, ghost. Not killed, as was everyone else, but just taken. And then Grin's like, all right, I don't know if you can understand me, but I got a talisman and I command you to stop. And all the ghosts stop attacking. I was like, all right, cool. Well, let's continue on. So at that point, Essence is like, all right, so here's the deal. Um, they are going for the heart of hell, which is this massively dark piece of energy, and they cannot be allowed to get their hands on it, or else the spirit of judgment is going to come and destroy the world in, like, the day of darkness. And Grifter's like, yeah, no, that sounds a little bit over our pay grade, but sure, whatever, let's go. So, at that point, uh, Essence is like, I'm gonna try to get you through, like, the ghosts, which are the sentinels. And at, like they will, they won't bother you for the most part. But you do need to move very quickly because I'm breaking a lot of rules doing this. And if if you die on this island, you will become one of these ghosts. And so they start making their way towards the heart of hell. And then we see the King of Gamora has a full on Minority Reports pool of children who can see the future, and they say, Ah, yes. That your followers have made their way to the heart of hell, but there are other people who are also searching for it. And the heart of hell is apparently just this lava pit, like straight out of a video game. It has like a bunch of rocks you can step on to make your way to the center. And it has the black diamond in the middle, which is confusing because last issue they specifically showed that the black diamond was in like a middle of a prison cell or something. But hey, whatever. So... At that point, the devout people have made their way there. They hear Team 7 coming up the rear, and so they start placing traps and whatnot. Once Team 7 arrives, they take out a few of the guys, but then Deathstroke gets separated from the rest of the group by an explosion that they set up. So at that point, the rest of the team is forced to retreat, leaving Deathstroke by himself against Grin. Uh, He seemingly doesn't back down. He just immediately starts slashing Grin, and he's like, Oh, you Americans, you can't... You'll never possess the god of vengeance. And I love this part here where he, he Grin goes for the diamond. Deathstroke says no and leaps after him with a knife. Grin says yes, is stabbed by the knife. And then he's like, oh, wait, no, don't touch it. Uh, you, you don't understand. It has such power. And Deathstroke goes, he touches the black diamond. And immediately, this is during an eclipse, mind you. He immediately becomes Eclipso. And he's like, yeah, Slade Wilson, this flesh will be more than suitable for my goals. So Deathstroke's now Eclipso. Um, This issue felt very fast. This issue felt like it was like, oh, we need to get to the end of this like now for no particular reason. I don't even know why. Like we got to the island and then it was just, here's Essence. Essence is telling you things you need. Like Essence didn't even do anything. I don't even know why she was here. Honestly, by the time it got to the point where Essence was protecting him from the ghosts, that should have been, like, the end of the issue. But instead, we got eight more pages that just kind of did what should have been the entirety of the next issue. I don't know why they insisted on going so fast here, but, hey, they did, and it's whatever. I'm going to give this one, like, a six, though, just because I really don't understand what it's going for. Maybe that's on me, but... It does seem that they just kind of got dropped into this mission and they're just rolling with the punches. And that's fine. I don't have an issue with that, but I don't feel like it's been explained to the reader exactly what's going on. Like, why does the Kaizen of Gamora have a minority report style pool of future vision seers? I just, it's iffy. It's iffy is the best way to say it, I think. So yeah, six Hopefully it improves. I think this is an eight issue run, so it's not even halfway there. Demon Knights number 15, written by Paul Cornell, art by Bernard Chang. This is another part of the Black Diamond probability. And last issue we left off with everyone arriving in Avalon. That is to say, the Questing Queen and her army, Lucifer and his army, the Demon Knights themselves, and 
an entire army defending Avalon of, I think they're called like Silent Knights or something like that. Regardless, the fight immediately breaks out. Everyone's attacking everyone else, and Xanadu gets the Demon Knights just up and out of the middle of the crossfire. And it seems that nobody particularly cares that the Silent Knights are there. The Questing Queen's going after Lucifer's army, and Lucifer's army's going after the Questing Queen. So they're just going up at each other. And Etrigan, who's trapped by the Queen, is like, Hey, uh, did you make my chains hellfire proof? And it's like, yeah, of course I did. Be stupid of me not to. And it's like, ah, right, but not normal fireproof. And then he just jumps up in front of a one of her mechanical dragons that's about to shoot fire and gets all of his chains burnt off. And he flies over to Lucifer, and Lucifer's like, hey, what the heck, bro? Seems like you betrayed me. And he's like, I didn't. This just wasn't part of my plan. And he's like, yeah, sure. After you so easily managed to escape those chains, nah, you betrayed me. You're out. And Edison is like, I'm not out. You're out. I will never work for any other man again. So at that point, he's he's on his own. Meanwhile, the demon knights who have taken up on top of this like weird floating cliff thing, they're like, all right, well, we have Merlin's body and now it's getting like a little bit glowy so maybe his soul is reconnecting to it like yeah maybe it's maybe it's coming back but regardless it has sent out a signal that comes out of the sky of arthur king arthur and his knights of avalon have come down and now they're a fourth army coming in to attack this crazy battle and vandal savage is looking on he's like this is King Arthur versus Lucifer. I'm pretty sure I should jump in just so the historians have something cool to talk about. And Exoristos then starts like freaking out. She's like, no, our only thing is we got to get out of here. We got to get out of here right now back to the main world. Let's do it. And I was like, you cool? And she's like, yeah, I just, I'm a little bit not okay right now. And Merlin's body starts talking, saying water. And Sir Euston tries to give him water. He's not having it, though, because it turns out he's not talking about drinking water. He wants water to come from the sky. He wants rain. And so Al Jabir pulls out a device that basically explodes in the air and lets makes a cloud of rain. And everyone's like, wow, that's pretty good. You almost magic. Almost. And as it starts raining everywhere uh, on the ground, King Arthur goes and attacks uh, Lucifer and the Questing Queen and just being like, all right, well, stand down. This is Avalon, and I'm Defender of the Realm. And they're like, screw you, man. Lucifer grabs uh, King Arthur by the throat, and Arthur just cuts off his arm. And we see everyone is now in the middle of the fight, and Horsewoman is like, hey, Algebeer, you cool? And he's like, I am just now coming to terms with the fact that magic is real, and I'm not even, like, anywhere close to on part of that. How am I supposed to deal with that? And Horsewoman's like, oh, easy, don't think about it. And they just keep fighting. And Etrigan goes after Merlin, grabs his body, and flies up in the air and just being like, this was my real plan all along. I, I knew that Xanadu was under her own free will. I, I just wanted you, Merlin. And Merlin's like, Etrigan, you're an idiot. Like, none of that's true. You're just making stuff up now because you feel guilty. And he uses his magic to cause a lightning strike that hits both himself and Etrigan. And as they go back down to the ground, Etrigan starts to stand up and Jason Blood just punches him in the face and tells him to go to hell. So at this point, Merlin's like, here's the thing, guys. I wasn't asking for rain just to make it dramatic. The rains of Avalon have a very specific purpose, and that is to wipe away any sort of spells or magic that is going on. So all of the devils, like, powers and stuff like that all of the questing queen spells just stop working and they're just more or less normal people in the reigns of avalon and mordru he sees this and he's like okay we're gonna bail bye and he just takes the questing queen and teleports out and then lucifer stands there and he's like i could still kill you guys i still have an army of demons and they're like yeah you're gonna lose all of those demons just because of avalon like everything that entertains you and lucifer's like Fair enough. I'm going to be back one day, though. Anyway, I've already set two other plans into motion. Bye. And he just goes through a portal out. And at this point, uh, everyone's like, all right, cool. We did it. We defended Avalon. Now we got to get the hell out of here. And Etrigan's like, no, I'm going to 
attack Merlin or whatever. And Merlin's like, here's the thing, guys. Uh, you ever see Doctor Who? Once you go through enough crap of dying and coming back and whatnot, you kind of got to regenerate. So guess it's that time for me. And he starts his magical regeneration and turns into Adam from Stormwatch number one. This is literally the moment of creation of Stormwatch. I'm not, this is, this is the lead in. So at that point, Adam is like, yeah, I'm still Merlin, but now I'm just going to go by Adam and I'm younger and I'm cooler and I'm hipper and I have more power too. And he takes Etrigan and just immediately throws him away and just like, yeah, you're nothing. And King Arthur's like, hey, Siriuston, uh, before all this is done and settled with, I'm going to knight you like officially. So Siriuston gets knighted by King Arthur as a knight of the storm so he used to watch for the storm of these things and he literally lists off all the different categories of the people of Stormwatch: the eminence of blades new apollos doctors of magic and an engineer his algebra and all that like it's just Stormwatch. so anyway at that point adam's like ah yes you are watching for the storm my storm watch excellent one more thing i got to take care of and he fuses back together Etrigan and Jason Blood before they even have anything to say about it. And he's like, you guys still have a fate that you need to fulfill. Need you guys to stay together. And Jason's like, oh, that sucks. But all right, if I have a fate, if I have a destiny, sure, why not? Let's go. So Adam sends them all back to the real world. And they're like, awesome, cool, we did it. We, we saved the day. Let's go back to that city that told us to go find out if Merlin's alive and tell them that he's cool and good over in Avalon. But um, immediately everyone's like, actually, hold on. Jason and Xanadu, they're going to just peace out for a while. They're, they're not going to be soldiers for Merlin because he, they feel like they, he screwed them over. Exoristos reveals, hey, I've got the Black Diamond. Does anybody remember Black Diamond? Prob I have it. And I I feel awful about doing that, so I should be on my own as well. And Sir Euston steps in and is like, no, I'll be with you. We can burden this together. And Exor is like, cool. And everyone's just kind of agreeing to go their separate ways, except for a horsewoman who's like, guys, we were literally just told that we're part of Stormwatch. Like, that's our destiny. And you guys are throwing it away? You're idiots. You suck. And she rides off. And... The thing teasing that teasing next issue is thirty years later. So, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, I really enjoyed it. I think that this was a super great issue. Um, it's a bit weird in that this is the Stormwatch tie-in. Like in Stormwatch, we were told that they started as the Demon Knights, and we were kind of given a little bit of backstory there. But this is the moment where it's like, no, now you guys are Stormwatch, and that book's just its own thing. So I like that kind of interconnectedness. I like to see when that happens. Um, I do think that it was a, it, it was well thought out enough. The armies had reason to go their own ways and that they lost their powers. It, it made sense the whole way through. I don't really have an issue with any of it. The only problem I think I would have is the fact that the Silent Knights, the ones that were there before Arthur came in, just kind of weren't used at all. But hey, that's whatever. So... I'm going to give this one, I'm going to give this one an eight just because I really, really enjoy when continuity is just super on point like that of this has bridged the gap between this 1600s team and this modern day team effortless, effortlessly. So yeah, really enjoy it and looking forward to seeing what happens in the next arc. Deathstroke number 15, written by Justin Jordan, art by Edgar Salazar and Amilcar Pina. This is totally new. Uh, the entire past arc and a half have been written by Rob Liefeld with, I believe, Joshua Williamson scripting. And this is just a new writer. Now, last issue, we had the tie into the green, sorry, the Hawkman story of Hawkman Wanted. But we weren't done the previous plot, and it kind of feels like we just dropped all of that so i'm not complaining but it, I, I'll, I'll just get into it so uh we have a small european country of sarvania 
and we have this guy who's basically forced at gunpoint to pull his own gun on this guy who I guess betrayed someone. And he says, I'm sorry, he shoots him in the head. And he's like, oh, it's okay, Alexei, it's all right. And then this huge guy steps up and just snaps his neck and saying like, oh, these men were brave, they were good, but they were they were standing up against me. So maybe you will know better. My name is Koshe. And someone steps up to me like, you're a monster. You're not even an animal. And he throws a Molotov at this guy. And, like he welcomes it as well. He's like, oh, that's your weapon. All right, come on, bring it on. And the Molotov hits him dead on, and he literally catches on fire. And as he does so, he goes over to the guy who threw the Molotov, and he's like, you don't understand. The reason I'm coming for this country, the reason I will be the one who runs it from now on, is because I am Koshe the Deathless. I cannot die. And so he catches this guy on fire. Immediately the guy dies of burning. And then when the flames go out, Koshe is like, anybody else want to give it a shot? And all of this was being shown on a video file to Deathstroke, who... He's basically being wined and dined and convinced to take on this contract. And he's like, what's going on, guys? You want to tell me what's going on? And they basically say, this guy, he just took over this small European country because seemingly nothing can kill him. And we figured that if anybody was able to do it, it would be Deathstroke. Because that's kind of your thing. And he's like, yeah, that is my thing. But why should I care about this guy? Like, what's the big deal? And they're like, well, here's the thing. Uh... Sarvania, kind of a crappy country, nobody really cares about it, until we discovered there was a massive amount of lithium underneath their country. And now we kind of want it for capitalist purposes. And he's like, all right, well, as long as you want to kill me, or as long as you pay me and you don't mind me killing him, because I am going to kill him, even if he is unkillable. So he walks out and he's already in Sarvania the next day. And as he's making his way through a marketplace, uh, someone sneaks up behind him. He pulls out a knife, about to kill. Turns out that it's his contact, and her name that she is giving is Elena. And she's like, all right, well, let's get to work. And they're just walking out in broad daylight, and Deathstroke's like, um, are you sure this is safe to just be walking out in daylight? And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. Do you understand how many people have tried and failed to kill this guy? Like, he doesn't care. He genuinely, like, whoever wants to revolt against them... He doesn't care. He will punish you if you fail, but, like, he doesn't mind the planning part. And so they're like, all right, so why do you want him gone? And he's like, basically, she's like, look, someone else is going to swoop in if he does end up dying. But I'm still going to pick the lesser of two evils. So they make their way to this giant palace that looks, like, straight out of Moscow. And Koshe's he's got, like, an orgy going on. He's drinking in his bed. And as he gets up and walks over to his balcony, his head just explodes. And we see Deathstroke there with a sniper rifle as it starts to reform. And he's like, ah, oh, crap. This guy can, like, really regenerate. Like, it isn't just a, a little wound thing. Like, it's a any sort of wound thing. And at that point, Koshi is like, ah, oh, you're a professional. Come on down. See what you got, what you can take. And so he makes his way down the uh, palace. And a mob basically just starts attacking him because half of the city thinks of him as a god that has come to, like, deliver them. Uh, but the palace police basically step up saying, hey, don't kill the assassin. Koshe wants to talk to him directly. So Destro gets dragged into the palace in front of Koshe. And he's like, oh, you genuinely thought you could escape? My people were never going to let that happen. Destro's like, it was never about an escape. I just figured the easiest way in here would be if your police brought me in. And he immediately breaks out of his handcuffs, shoots all the other guards, and starts a fight against Koshe. And of course, bullets do nothing on him. And so Testrook literally throws the gun at him, lodges itself into his chest, and he starts internally like, this guy might be as strong as I am, which is a little bit of an issue. And as Koshe picks him up, uh, Deathstroke's He's been analyzing him and realizes that this guy's strong, but he doesn't have any training. He's just like a brute. So Destro can beat him with a little bit of strategy. And so during the fight, Koshe like holds him up and is just like, oh, you think that you can kill me? I'm deathless. And he's like, yeah, but I doubt that means painless. And he takes a grenade out, shoves it down Koshe's pants, and then kicks him away as the explosion forces Deathstroke out the uh, window. And he's like, See, here's the thing. During our conversation, Koshe gave something up. He said that he can only die when he wills it. So I know how to kill the unkillable man. And that's where it leads off. Um, 
it's not Rob Liefeld. That's a 10. No, it's it's I, I am happy because this does feel like a needed change in pacing. It's just I don't know. I was so who cares about like the past 10 issues of Deathstroke? Like all of it was going against the stuff that I loved in that first arc where it was just balls to the wall crazy. And then it was just like, no, Deathstroke, he cares about feelings and such like that. And now I feel like we're finally back to the... Now, here's a guy who's just taking a contract because he wants to prove that he is the best, which is that same thing the first arc did. So I at least enjoyed it. I think the art still leaves a little bit to be desired of. It isn't the best. Um, a lot of the people feel a little bit like plain. It just panels feel empty. I don't know. It's, it's hard to put in the words, but it's not the best style i think for deathstroke um but overall i get this one like easily a seven i think that it's and that's entirely by comparison to like the last 10 issues standing on its own it's probably more like a six something but i'm willing to give it a seven just because i'm so happy for the change of pace that deathstroke has finally gotten here so i think this series ends sooner rather than later but we'll see how long it manages to stick it out Grifter, number 15, written by Frank Thierry, art by Merritt Michaels. Last issue, Grifter got teleported into Bell Reeve, a.k.a. in front of the Suicide Squad, and now he's got a host of problems. This issue... Okay, so there's a framing device. We'll get back to it. But basically, Grifter's on the run from the Suicide Squad, and this is, like, set maybe four or five months ago, so... It's still the squad as you stereotypically think of it. And he's being chased down by El Diablos, Deadshot, and Harley Quinn. And I think Iceberg as well. And he's like, all right, this isn't ideal, but maybe I should be able to get away from this. And he manages to lose the squad and starts taking, like, pot shots from the rafters. And as Deadshot starts trying to shoot him, he uses his telekinesis to redirect the bullets. Harley comes at him with a mallet, uses the TK to attack Deadshot. And Deadshot's like, for Christ's sake, people, he has telekinesis. Can we please stop attacking in a way that he can redirect? And so El Diablo steps in and tries to set him on fire. And I don't even know how, but he manages to redirect El Diablo's fire onto Deadshot, which... Okay, and then he just throws up a big TK thing and blasts them all away. Until finally, King Shark shows up out of nowhere, starts biting Grifter, and then spits him out and says, Oh, I don't like it when my food moves around too much. And as he throws Grifter down on the ground, all the rest of the Suicide, suicide Squad members just show up and start kicking him. Like it was a schoolyard fight. They're like, yeah, take some of this. Stay down. So at that point, they manage to get him all roped up and Waller steps in saying, Hey, hey, Grifter. Hey, Cole Cash. Let's have a conversation. Rest of the squad, get out of here. And at that point, he, she basically says, Now here's the thing. I don't know why you're here, but we used to work on Team 7 together. Please read Team 7. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a wake-up call here because if I thought that you were beyond saving here, you'd already be dead. So then we'll, let me get into the framing device story. So we have this basically cult meeting calling themselves the resistance where they are being informed about like the secret alien invasion that's going on and taking over all groups of the government. And Amanda Waller is tasked with getting a woman out of this cult because someone very high up in the government is her uncle. And Waller's like, yes, consider it done, sir. I'm already on the case. And he's like, yeah, I'll see it when I believe it. Because your Team 7 days, please read Team 7, did not impress. So she gets into the cult meeting. And it turns out that this entire thing is actually about the Daemonites. Like, it is the actual alien invasion that is actually happening, but they're just brushing it off as crazy. And Waller gets in and, like, 
says to the girl, it's like, oh, man, do you actually believe all this? She's like, oh, yeah, my name's Kelly. I don't believe any of this. I was just trying to stick it to my dad, but I can't really leave now. And Waller's like, why not? And at that point, two big muscly guys step saying, like, can you two ladies please come with us? So at that point, they're being led down a hallway and they're causing some sort of trouble. And then Waller turns on the guy, grabs his gun and forces them or forces the two of them to let her and the uh, target out of there. And Waller lets on, like, oh, I'm actually a secret agent, Kelly, and I'm going to save you on behalf of your uncle. And then all of a sudden, this shadowy figure shows up, and this is where the framing device kicks back in, is that Waller wants to show Cole Cash this, and it turns out that the guy who's a shadowy figure that disarmed Waller, his name is Warwick, the same guy who basically told Cole to do this entire espionage thing into Stormwatch at the beginning of this arc. And Warwick just tells everything the truth about uh, Daemonites and whatnot. He's like, it's the Daemonites. They're doing this thing. He's doing whatever. But he basically tells him, like, you aren't here. Hold here against your will. I'm sorry if you felt that way. The door's right there. You're welcome to go. But please take this pamphlet. It is the truth. And so sends it out. And then as Waller's explaining all this to Cole, he's like, yeah, your guy, your dude who, like, sets you on this path, he's been in and out of loony bins and cults and stuff like this for a long time. And, like, does any of this sound familiar of, you know, these daemonites and they're experimenting on humans and chosen ones and stuff like that? And Waller's like, look, believe him, or you can believe that all this stuff happened. Just don't believe him. He is actually crazy. And he spent all this time inside like mental asylums. And so she's like, all right, that's all I wanted to tell you. Whatever you do from this point on, if you come back in here again, we will kill you. But I'm assuming that you won't be bothering us anymore. So they let Cole go and Cole's like, all right, I'm going to go get some questions answered myself, supposedly on the way to go talk to Warwick. And last next issue is the last issue. But here's the issue with this issue. It's not good. <laughs> like, okay, so the entire issue that we've had up to this point is that they decided somewhere along the way to just pivot and just say, like, hey, remember that entire, like, first two arcs of this book? None of that actually happened. You don't pay attention to any of that. Now you're paying attention from the zero issue onwards or when Rob Liefeld stepped in. And I just... It annoys me to such a great extent that, like, none of... Because I don't even know where to begin. It's, let me just say art-wise. Art-wise, Merrick Michaels, not great. Not at least in this book. All of the backgrounds were, like, completely empty. And about, like, 40% of the faces were just not human faces. They were just wrong. So already on a bad streak there. But then just adding on top of it the fact of... This book revolved around Grifter going through and fighting the Daemonites. And then in a Superman annual book, they killed all the Daemonites. So, like, I get that if you want this book to keep going, you gotta pivot, but they pivoted the wrong direction. Now they went to this whole thing of, like, oh, who can Grifter actually trust? But, like, there's no mission anymore. They have yet to establish a new mission for Grifter. This is all just going off the old stuff. I don't I don't get it. And frankly, it's not particularly well written either because half this stuff is indecipherable until you get to this point in the book. And even then, I'm still confused. I'm like, what what are they saying here? That Grifter's making up his telekinetic powers? That he forgot the whole first arc? Because yeah, maybe. I'm sure he did. That he forgot he he fought a bunch of Daemonites. They were there. I don't understand how now it's like, no, actually, this guy's just crazy. And he thinks there are aliens. But, like, there were. You saw them. You fought them. You beat them. I don't understand what this book is doing anymore. So, uh, I'm giving it a 2.5. I don't like it. It's just not good anymore. I, I was into this at one point. I thought it was at least interesting, but... It's been a long time since then, so this is a 2.5, and I don't hold my breath that it's going to stick this finale any better. Legion Lost number 15, written by Tom DeFalco, art by Andre Grinaldo. Last issue we left off with 
the villain Dagor summoning this giant mechanical city looking thing of a machine or whatever. And then Gates saying like, hey, I recognize that thing. It's the thing that's going to kill literally all of us. So this issue picks up. The fight's still continuing. Superboy is just repeating over and over again, kill, maim, destroy, because he's still under the mental empowerment of Harvest. And the initial, I don't know, narration, if you want to call it that, despite the fact that it's uh, kind of just third person, is basically just walking through everything that's happened. And it's saying like, oh, this is Timberwolf. He's tearing stuff apart and there's an alien army and the Legionnaires are here and Superboy's here and there's Caitlin Fairchild from the Ravagers and the Ravagers are here and also Harvest is here with his robot lackeys. So everyone cool? Everyone got that? Great. So this giant machine is like trying to build itself into this super destructive mess. Tyrock, Timberwolf, they're all tearing it apart as best they can, but they can't seem to get through the force field that is around this thing. And Tyrock's like, okay... Maybe Gates can teleport into it. He's he's not usually good with through the uh, force fields, but maybe he can find a way. And Captain Adam, the guy who traveled back in time, is like, this thing is a world killer. We got to stop it now because this is like literally what would destroy the entire timeline. The thing that like I saw. And essentially the fight continues on. Gates is like, hey... Uh, Timberwolf, for real though, we should bail. And he's like, we are Legionnaires, Gates. We we either, we fight to the end or whatever. And we see at one point uh, Ridge from the Ravagers talks to Chameleon Girl. And he's like, Chameleon Girl, you need some time to recover. Step out. And she's like, no, my team's still fighting. I will also fight. And he's like, cool. Go for it. So then we get, like, the core of the issue here, which is Wildfire. He's stepping back up. Dawn Star is like, hey, sit it out, man. You you are not okay. And he's like, my energy's back. I'm going to go up there. I'm going to fight Dagger because it's what has to happen. And she's like, your suit's literally about to break, and that's kind of a bad thing. And he's like, yeah, I know the risk, but I got to do it. So he flies up into space. Uh, Psykill, one of the Harvest goons, also comes with. And he's like, hey... Me and you, we were in the culling together, but now we're on the same side. Crazy that. Anyway, for the sake of the planet, let's fight together. And Wildfire's like, I I guess, sure, for the sake of the planet. And so they get up, and they're fighting against Dagor and Thrax. And Dagor's like, wow, you're the first person to ever fight against me after I smacked them down the first time. And he's like, that just means I'm the first Legionnaire you've ever fought. So back down on Earth, Superboy's just doing his whole kill, maim, destroy thing. And Detective Lore is like, Superboy, you gotta fight it. You're under his control. You gotta fight against it. And Superboy looks over at her and it's seemingly meaningful. And then he goes, kill, maim, destroy. So that's just gonna keep going for a little bit. Uh, Ridge is fighting alongside Warblade, I think. Honestly, I don't care about the harvest guys at all but either way warblade basically says hey got a message for your ridge for you to bring back to your ravagers book uh you can get back in whenever you want you're allowed back into the ravagers no harm no foul just uh in exchange for one small favor and they don't say what the favor is but i'm sure it's in the ravagers book uh so then we go back up to wildfire and Psykill, and Psykill manages to come to the conclusion that this guy is able to siphon their power and use it against them and that's how he's always able to keep the upper hand and dagger's like huh you're like literally the first people that have ever discovered that like nobody ever lives long enough to figure it out so i guess i gotta kill you now and he blasts wildfire's face mask which is already cracked and it causes him to explode and all the legion pause and they're like oh crap wildfire's dead and Dagor's like, oh, that was an awesome death. I'm going to write him a song as soon as this is all done. But regardless, we got to get it done now. And Dawnstar is just grieving. Like, he's dead. I never got to tell him how much I'll always love him. And Telus is like, he's not, like, dead, dead, though. Like, his energy's still around. And that's never going to go away. So he'll be watching over you. Does that help? And she's like, yes, that does help. We are Legion. We will restore him. And so she, she angrily is back in the fight. And it cuts back over to Tyrock and Captain Adam. And Adam's like, hey, here's the deal. I got an idea. I need to run this by you, Tyrock. And Tyrock's like, all right, what is it? I'm going to use my time bubble. And I'm going to go back to an hour before this guy ever even showed up with the machine. I'm going to plant myself 
and a huge self-destruct thing in the area where it would explode, and therefore when it lands, I can set it off and destroy it. And they're like, uh, you do understand that the self-destruct thing you're talking about is a singularity bomb, and it will destroy like half a continent. And he's like, I'm willing to sacrifice millions if it sa means saving quintillions, because, you know, he's going to go on to kill later worlds. And Tyrex like, no, no, we can't do that. What about Gates? And Telus is like, Gates not responding. I don't know where he is. Meanwhile, Gates is over at the time bubble like, I'm going to just bail. Like, I gave them their chance. I'm out of here. Or at least it seems like he's going to, but I'm sure he's not actually. And so Captain Adam's like, all right, discussion over Tyrock. We're doing it. And Tyrock's like, no, I refuse. And so then Adam turns to Detective Lore, who's technically a subordinate, and it's like, Detective Lore, you run cover for me while I go do this. And she's like, no, that sounds like a stupid idea. And he turns to Chameleon Girl. Chameleon Girl, you've been serving us secretly. You cover me. And she's like, no, I'm with the Legion. And he's like, Jesus Christ, does anyone know about the order of like listening to your superior officers here? And in that moment, as they're about to get overwhelmed, Harvest shows up and he's like, hey, remember me? I'm in this fight, and I completely wholeheartedly support killing millions of people. You have my support, Captain Adam. And that's where the issue leaves off, with the finale next month. Um, there's like four pages in this that I would just cut wholesale. Superboy, Ridge, probably Chameleon Girl as well, and Gates. Uh, but for the rest of it, of like in the middle of the fight stuff, I'm down with that. And the whole wildfire bit was good as well. If anything, I'd expand that to just be the whole of the issue because that was by far the more interesting part. And it just felt kind of like, oh, hey, you guys are actually possibly about to get the upper hand in a fight. <sighs> All right, not anymore. Um, so it's good. It's a fine issue. I don't really hate it in any regard. I will say it finally took me to 15 issues where I'm not second guessing myself in terms of the names of these characters, except for Timberwolf. That one always takes me a second, but yeah, it's a, it's, it's a fine issue. Um, my only critique is that while it does feel large, while it does feel like a big story, it doesn't feel from a meta standpoint, like a finale sort of story, you know? It doesn't feel like this is where we're leaving off the series. It just feels a little bit like we know that the world isn't going to end. Like, we get that. So, I don't know. I feel like the the because of the fact that the rest of the universe has to continue on, this just kind of feels like it loses stakes because of that. But that's a meta standpoint. It's good in its own right if you're, like, only reading this book. Um, so, overall, I'm going to give this one a... Uh, I'll give it a seven. It's perfectly fine. It's serviceable. It's it's a solid read, but it's nothing amazing. So we'll see how it wraps it all up in the final issue next month. The Ravagers, issue seven, written by Howard Mackey, art by a lot of people. Uh... Edward Pansica, Daniel HDR, Geraldo Boras, Jez, and Ian Churchill. And last issue, we had the Ravagers going to pick up a girl named Lisa, who I guess has some sort of powers and was going to be collected by Harvest. But of course, Harvest got there first. And now it's a smackdown between Warblade and Rose versus the Ravagers. So this issue picks up. Lisa's watching on and just like, you know... I'm just going to straight up say my powers are future sight. I'm able to see things in the future in my dreams, but like it's a bunch of different versions of the future. And uh, in all the futures I've seen, I've seen this day quite a bit. And there's a lot of futures where the Ravagers lose, but in the ways when the Ravagers win, uh, Caitlin Fairchild, she's the key. She's the one who's got to bring it all together. So Caitlin gets knocked out by Rose and is knocked over to a tree where Lisa is. And so she's like, I got to like, show her what to do while also like not influencing the future itself so she reaches around uh caitlin's head and says like i have to show you something and she shows caitlin immediately like the future but it's like the right now future so she shows a uh, ridge versus warblade and ridge gets sh like stabbed in the stomach and then cuts over to Rose and Superboy, and Rose stabs Superboy through the chest, which I don't feel like should be possible, but sure, whatever. And then Rose goes over to Caitlyn, just like, here's the deal. 
Caitlin. I'm not going to let you die. I'm going to let you see how all of this happens because you've accelerated the plans that Harvest has. And now you get to see it all to fruition. And we see even farther in the future, like the heads of the Ravagers, the good ones. Uh, meanwhile, Beast Boy, Terra, they've all been transformed over to the evil side. Uh, Niles Calder is killed. The Teen Titans are killed. Cities are brought down to the ground as Harvest's army takes over. And it's only at the end of all that that Caitlyn is finally granted a death by uh, Rose's sword. And then Caitlyn wakes up and she's like, whoa, hey, what happened? And Lisa explains like, I just showed you the future, but it's like a possible future. And you kind of need to get in there and change things up. So please do things for the better, okay? And then Caitlyn looks across the field and it's like that scene is just about to start playing out where Ridge versus Warblade and Superboy versus Rose and so she's like, okay, uh, how do I change things? And she looks over and sees Tara just standing on the sidelines, like unwilling to jump in. And she's like, Tara, you are so powerful. You can get in there and you can change this. They're not in control. And she's like, I can't, I can't do it. Like we, he did so many things to me. And she's like, look, this is your chance. It's a chance for, and then Tara just like gets this grin on her face. And she's like, this is a chance for revenge. And Caitlin's like, I was... I was going for freedom, but, you know, you do you. And so then Tara immediately starts unleashing, like, her full power, starts destroying the entirety of the ground beneath them. And Rose and Warblade rush in and just like, oh, bring it, girl, we can take you. And she's like, no, you can't. And immediately she just drops down the earth beneath them and is totally willing to straight up kill them. And the rest of the team jumps in being like, hey, hey don't kill them. We're, we're only better than them because we don't kill them. And it's like, she's like, no, like we, they are going to come back again. We have to do this. We have to end them once and for all. And Ridge is kind of like, maybe she has a point. Maybe it's something we should discuss. Uh, and Caitlin's immediately chewing him out for it. But then Tara's like, no, no discussion. We end this now. And Terry uses her powers to cause an earth spike that just impales Warblade through the chest. And Beast Boy's like, what did you do? And she's like, oh, I've, I've accepted my power. I've embraced it. I've, it feels great to have this much power. And then Warblade starts laughing. And he's like, you do understand that I'm like 90% robot? Like, you're not going to kill me that easily. But hey, super cool to see you go the way of evil, Terra. You've definitely got a membership on our team. Can't wait to see you. And Terra's like, no, I'll never be one of you. But then at that point, it's too late and uh the they managed to escape and lisa comes up behind and is just like what the heck guys caitlin i told you to make things better but you literally went down one of the bad paths one of the bad futures i saw and she's like well show me how to fix it and she's like no you're just gonna mess stuff up more just screw it i don't want to be part of your team either i'm out peace don't follow me so she just runs away and caitlin's like ah crap all right well something's happened here and tara's like yeah i don't feel like the same as i did before something's definitely wrong so they go back to niles calder's like training center and caitlin's like hey uh i was kind of showing the future and you're right in that we have no idea how powerful they are and we definitely need to teach them how to control that stuff and niles is like yeah no worries we'll, we'll figure out how to do that and we'll We'll take whatever extreme measures are necessary. And then we have an epilogue page of watching the fight between Rose and Caitlin from the very beginning of the issue. And all of it becomes more focused on Rose as we see Deathstroke is watching. Because very clearly, Deathstroke is Rose's father. So I don't, I don't know if they were going for a reveal here, but we definitely had her named as Rose Wilson before. So I... I Either way, he's interested now. Um, I think this was an okay issue. It's not great by any means, but it is certainly... It does a good job of showing that these kids that are on the Ravagers are not, like, typical heroes. And it does it in more so of a way of... Instead of just, like, in their heads being like, am I a weapon or am I human? like Superboy does every time he breathes, it does a good job of showing Terra just being like, no, I stepped over the line. Like, I I did the bad thing. And even though it didn't have 
immediate consequences, they still did it. And it's not, you're not able to come back from that as easily from a character standpoint. So I definitely think that that was a solid move to show that sort of thing in this book. Um, Art-wise, it's fine. Nothing amazing. A couple weird faces here or there, but it's just a stock standard sort of house style book. So overall, I'm going to say this is probably a... I'm going to say 7. It's a low 7. It's pretty much 7.000, but it is still a 7. So I'm curious to see how we're going to continue on this point. It's going to be interesting to see if there is any actual meaningful team generated because i think it was only just two issues ago they were like yeah we're the ravagers we're gonna work against harvest and now they're like oh yeah but we like we're broken people and we need to learn how to deal with that and that's it that's all the comics came out from dc comics this december 12th 2012 and i'm going to try to keep this ending section a little bit brief not because i'm running over exclusively on time or anything like that but i know it's hard to believe but as a guy who reads comics on the internet every week for the past year and a half i do have a life i know it's shocking anyway Next week, December 19th, we have 13 comics coming out, including the number 15 issues of Batwoman, Birds of Prey, Catwoman, Nightwing, Red Hood, Supergirl, Green Lantern, Green Lantern, New Guardians, DC Universe Presents, Wonder Woman, Blue Beetle, and Legion of Superheroes. Additionally, we have the number three issue of Sword of Sorcery. If you haven't been listening to that, be sure you do, because I really, really like that book. Anyway... In the description, be sure to check it out. We got a link to our Twitter, we got a link to a Discord, and we got a link to a Patreon. Some of those you have to pay for, some of those are free. Twitter, it's kind of up to you, depending on whether or not you buy the hype. But anyway, that's going to do it for me. Thank you very much for watching, listening, however it is you consume this podcast. Be sure to give it five stars on your thumbs up, on your iPods and iTunes and Pod Beans. And be sure to always remember, if it ain't broke, don't... Fix it.